So as people are leaving, you can see we coordinate. Whoop, that's the wrong one. I went too, one too far. We coordinate the hymns sometimes with what's going to be shared, right? So we just did the Lord's return, be awake, he's coming. That's somewhat why we chose that hymn. Amen. Let me begin with some prayer. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you for this gospel of Mark that you spoke that almost uh, over 2,000 years ago, and yet you're still speaking to us today. How you desire for us to know you as the servant and the one who came to give his life as a ransom for the many. And also we would realize that doesn't stop when we receive you, but we also, that life for, as a ransom can ransom us from our vain manner of life we inherited from our, our heritage, from all the past practices that your light has opened us to see uh, don't mean that much to you. Everything that's not you, Lord, redeem us from that, Lord, that we could really be drawn to appreciate you, your church, and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I, I would like to... Uh, start i always we always show you these two verses at least for myself i'd like to always say just a little word even for 30 seconds about these two leading verses and it's especially today uh the first verse mark 10 45 let's see if i can uh uh we can read it together or recite it together for even the son of man came did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay. Now, this week, I highlighted the words to serve. Uh, to serve, uh, i just like to consider that for a minute with you. Okay, I might have told Rick this, and I don't know if Bruce at one time or Steve, I said, you know, the Lord survives opposition. In fact, he defeated Satan on the cross. It was executed. He's just waiting for that sentence to be carried out. But to tell you the truth, it's the help that worries him. Opposition doesn't scare him. He defeated the enemy. It's the help. Okay, especially when you look at the disciples. So what do I mean by that? And we'll get to that. Just consider that for a moment. Because the matter of serving, wouldn't it have been simple if the Lord was just by, if all he wanted to do was die for our sins and be a ransom for many, he should have gone solo. Would have been much easier, right? So why did he carry around 12 disciples with him, one who would even betray him, and the other 11 who took turns being the unclear disciple, I like to use that word. They took turns, and the others were semi-clear disciples. Because this is part of the Lord's way of serving us today, knowing we would come along many years later. When you read the Gospels, you pay attention to the Lord as our Savior. We also need to pay attention to how the disciples learned by making mistakes and more mistakes and over time learning to trust the Lord's presence. So uh, there's a book by Andrew Murray I have always appreciated. It's on prayer. Today I think it's called Lessons on Prayer, but the title he gave it was With Christ in the School of Prayer. The master is the teacher and we are the students together. So I'm going to use this phrase, the disciples are our classmates. So what you're going to see today is what can we learn from our classmates as much as we learn from how the Lord serves us. And of course, the second verse, behold my servant, eventually what they learned was we really need to focus on one thing, and that's beholding the servant. Okay? So we're going to be in Mark 13 today, uh, going to focus on the beginning and the end of the chapter. In the middle will just be kind of a broad brush approach. But the title of the message is Watch and Be Awake. 
Okay, first question is when and where does Mark 13 occur? Let me just go to the first verse, two verses. Uh-oh. Okay, right there. So the answer to where is very simple. He was going out of the temple. So where's the temple? Jerusalem, right? One question answered, okay? So that's where does Mark 13 occur? When does it occur? The first two verses go together. If you look at a timeline in the chronology of the Gospels, he was in the home of Martha and Mary, which is what John says, six days before the Passover. Six days before he would become the Passover. And the next day, he approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives. And I'm going to try this fancy button. Pay attention. Mount of Olives will show up again today. It also shows up in Mark 15 where he's crucified, right? So significant placement where he is. So he has arrived in Bethany, uh, I think Bruce or Rick said about two and a half, three miles from Jerusalem. Within walking distance, gets up the next day and goes into Jerusalem and spends some time there. After Mark 13 is Mark 14. The Passover and the unleavened bread are now two days away. So this portion, Mark 11, 12, and 13, are over a four-day period. And what goes on during that four-day period, the crowd receives him with Hosanna. The Lord comes in, doesn't comment too much. He did send certainly his disciples to get the donkey or the colt of a donkey to carry him. He was cognizant of the crowd's shouting and praise of him. But he comes in a very interesting verse is Mark 11, 11. He looks around, doesn't say anything, and it says he leaves without saying anything at the temple. The next day he comes back. This is the second bullet. He cleansed the temple. He speaks about the fig tree. Now, this is my personal choice. I call it a speaking. Most people call it a cursing of the fig tree. It's just an honest evaluation. Big tree, you're not doing what you should be doing. You're not going to bear fruit anymore. And so a, one commentator I found, it's not about fruit or not fruit. It's linking the fig tree to the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. He's using that as a reference point, showing that Israel is not living up to what he hoped it would at that point. And so he is going to move on to the new covenant at this point, okay? And then he gives the parable about the vineyard. If you read Mark, uh, Mark 12 says them, 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 them. It doesn't give a, pro, uh, what do you call it, pro, not proper noun, not proper noun. What do you call it, a, a, like a person, place, or thing? It's not a pronoun, but a, just a noun, I guess. I thought there was a type of noun for that. So it's a name. You go back to chapter 11, it's the collection, it's the best collection, I think it's the priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people. All the big shots question him on his authority. So eventually, there's them throughout the first 12 verses of Mark 12. He's talking to them in this parable of the vineyard. In fact, it says they recognized he's talking about us. All the big shots said, we're in trouble, and it might even mention at that point, from that point, they got more serious about conspiring to kill him. Whether it's true or not, hard to say, but at least it, it, it snowballed from that point on. So the disciples are with him. So you're observing all this. You're seeing all this. You're hearing the parable. And then he answers all the various Jewish parties and alliances, I like to call it, answers wisely. They even ask him a question. So the last three things they saw, and this is Steve's review from last week. Should I test? Can I, should I test it? I'll give you, look quickly. Okay, the first one is a revelation about the blank Christ. Wonderful Christ, Isaiah 9, 6. And this question should stimulate 
consideration and grant revelation. So at Mark 12, 37a in the, I think it's in the NASB says, so in what sense is he his son? Very interesting. So he's called both the son of God and the son of man. So in what sense is he, capital H, Jesus, the son of David as the son of man? In what sense is Jesus the Lord of David as the son of God? See, yeah, all our New Testament teaching in one question comes out. He's really trying to stimulate consideration and give them revelation, but instead they just continue on wanting to crucify him. Then he gives a warning about the scribes who seek self-glory and are, their prayers are genuine or disingenuous. Multiple choice. Disingenuous prayers to God. So he just says, beware of the scribes. Then he observes a woman casting in, and not only the woman, but others putting, contributing to the treasury of the temple. And he makes a comment that the poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury when physically she offered the least. So there's some realization there. It's inward, not outward. We need to see who Christ is. He's the son of God and the son of man. He's the Lord of David and the son of David. And we need to beware of making a pretense, a show in hypocrisy. So this is why, to me, let's read these two verses together. This seems out of place. Okay, could we read it together, please? What's up there? You see why this is a puzzle? After spending three or four days observing all these things going on, and even the most recent things are these three things, then very interesting utterance. Jesus was going out or going away from the temple. He was living, leaving the temple. And I believe, because Mark 14 comes next, he's on his way to Bethany, and he would not be back in the temple again to the crowds. He would only return to the temple to be judged by the Jewish um, high priest and the father of the high priest. I don't know if that was both at the temple, but it was probably in the temple, temple precinct at least. So he's leaving the temple. So it's clear I'm leaving. I'm getting ready for my crucifixion. And one of the disciples says, look at this huge stone. Now, it's actually pretty impressive. That temple was small when it was rebuilt in Ezra and Nehemiah's time. Then Herod, sorry, I forgot to look it up, Steve. It's the Herod that killed the babies of Jesus, right? The, the, sorry, not, uh, the, uh, be, the babies around Bethlehem. It was that Herod. There's several Herods. For political reasons, expanded the temple. So they had, can you imagine this, Mike? They had an st uncut stone 40 feet long of marble. Where would you, I, that, that's just, even with hand tools. How? <laughs> yeah, they didn't have a Menards to go shop at. That wasn't a stock item at Menards to get. They had to go to the quarry. So, that, and even, uh, the temple was so marvelous that the Roman general Titus wanted to present it to the Caesar. This was a Roman practice. You'd conquer a town and take that treasure, rename it, repurpose it, and give it to the emperor. So this is now the emperor's new temple. But the Lord would not allow that to happen. So the disciples are not on the same page. Same, sound familiar? Uh, I told brothers yesterday, I said, can you, I, I showed up at a meeting, your brother asked me, what are you doing here? You're one of the last people I thought would ever get saved. 
So easy to judge things by the outward condition, right? But the Lord just gives a very frank word, and it was carried out during the lifetime of the majority of the apostles at that point. James, of course, the brother of John, was martyred early, but the others, many of them probably saw this occur. He said, not one stone shall be left upon the other. I looked it up uh, when Titus conquered Jerusalem. He had legions. Legions are like six or 8,000 people. They have chariots and horses. And he left one whole legion behind to do this work. So six to 8,000 people were tearing this thing down, digging it up, and just breaking a 40-foot stone into marbles just to do this. And a quote by, it might be Josephus, said, you could never tell there was even a temple there when they were done. Wow. So the Lord, it's the Lord, we, you know, just really be clear. We really need to learn to pay attention to the Lord. Okay. Then, he's, okay, let's read uh, these verses together. That's very interesting. They asked the question when, yes. and the Lord begins a kind of discourse with two strong verbs, do not be misled, and do not be frightened. So it's kind of like I invite Rick and Barb to dinner, and I ask them when you will be there, and they say, well, don't burn yourself cooking. That's kind of related, right? Or, but what if they would, they would tell me, uh, you know, there's a new store opening up the street from you. No context, seems to be no connection, but this is what I'm saying. This is how the Lord serves us. Our fellow students, our classmates are being helped by this kind of statement. They're looking for outward signs. They want to see something. The Lord is concerned for their person. Fear and being misled show a concern for the person. Just consider as a parent. Uh, my dad really didn't care what I got my degree. He just wanted to see me graduate because of following Christ. I went to four schools over a seven-year period. So. He was just happy, but he's concerned for me. When I got married, he never asked me where I was traveling or what was going on in the so-called work I was doing. He'd say, how is your wife and kids handling you being gone so much? So there's a concern for the person. So the concern for the person here is from the master of his slaves, of his servants, of the master, for the ones that would become apostles and eventually would be called to preach the gospel. We'll see that in the next set of verses. So it's really amazing. We ask the Lord all kinds of questions and don't get the answer we're expecting. I read somewhere or might have heard it. You know, when the Lord doesn't answer your prayer, that was the answer. Have you ever heard that? The answer is no. <laughs> yeah, or I really don't care. 
You know what I mean? So we, you know, pray about, should I put on brown shoes or black shoes today? I'm wearing brown, but this is blue. So should I wear brown or black? If I pray that, the Lord doesn't answer. Just put on some shoes and go minister Christ to the saints, right? Or you ask for something, you ask for something, you don't get it. No is an answer. Unanswered prayer sometimes is the answer no. Because he cares for our person, because the people we are determine how we can serve him and what we can accomplish for him. Certainly, he cares for our actions. It's no excuse to be sloppy. But the way he cares for our actions is to first care for our person. So he tells us, don't be misled, don't be frightened, things are going to occur, you are a person. In other words, if you're told don't be misled, or you tell me, Jeff, don't be misled, that means I'm susceptible to being misled. Happens all the time. Whoa, do you see that? Even just when I did that, you want to look over there where I'm looking. It's just human beings our influence, we have senses and sensory perception, how to apply those senses and our sensory perception to focus on the Lord. We need this kind of word. Don't be misled and don't be frightened. Things go on all the time where the Lord is the last person I think of. Uh, this week, I never realized how easy I have as an American till my AC went out. But that's not what I talked to my wife and daughter and son-in-law about. Oh, this is terrible. This is Satan's persecution. Even Don came over. I changed as many things as I could, and it still won't work, and the repairman isn't calling me back. Let's see. Does that qualify for a nation rising up against nation? The nation, nation of Jeff against the nation of the air conditioning repairman? Kingdom against kingdom. Was that an earthquake? I mean, I sweated this week. Is that equivalent to an earthquake? Don't be frightened. Don't be misled. Why? And that's why these next verses. Uh, Ted, could you read these verses, please? Yes. Stand before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you are about to say. But say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father and his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Okay, do you see in verse 10, I have bolded the gospel must first be preached. These disciples are classmates. We're also called apostles to be with the Lord and to go out and testify for the Lord. So in his concern for them and knowing that he would in the near future res uh, be crucified, resurrect and ascend is preparing them for life. Not only just after I'm not physically with you, because I'm dying. That was only for a short period of time, three days or less. But when he ascended, how has he been with us for the last 2,000 years? Yet the charge to our classmates was to go preach the gospel in Acts 1.8. And it's not the same charge they received Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, we're, we're going on a two-month excursion and coming back and reporting to Jesus, the Master, and the Teacher, and all that's going on, and he can evaluate us. We're going to have to learn to carry our charge out by finding the Lord in a non-physical manner. For them, it was a real 
conversion. It's a real conversion experience from the physical to the spiritual. The spiritual is the only realm, at least for myself, I've ever known. Jesus hasn't appeared to me as he did to Paul, at least. I don't, I don't speak for everyone, but at least for the majority of we have only known the Spirit's leading and the Spirit's speaking in carrying out what charge we have. So you really see someone looking at classmates, knowing that many more classmates are going to follow them. And there's some principles, like ground rules I want to lay down here. Concerning the temple, it's not going to be here. In your lifetime, it's gone. But I'm not going to tell you that the when that will be, although it occurred. I'm going to tell you how you need to live until you see me the second time. Because I'm going to charge you with something. And the only way you can check with me is by the Holy Spirit leading you in what you speak. So the persecution. The fear, the being distracted, all comes from the commission the Lord has given us. Given us personally, how we live before others, and how we speak to them, both with our words and by what they see in our living. So for that, he has this phrase at the beginning of verse 9, be on guard. This will be one of three different words. Uh, this is the keynote to this chapter be on guard other places it will say be on awake be awake watch or other words like that this one is the general word for look blepo so i know ted knows and steve know greek just means look look when you see things observe perceive be aware these things are going to happen you will live and you will see these things in your lifetime be aware of it Okay, from there he goes on, and this is where I said I'm just going to kind of broad brush it. He talks about what will be the signs of his second coming. There's something called the abomination of desolation. I think uh, everyone in this room knows what that is. That's the Antichrist setting up the image of his idol in the temple. There's tribulation and persecution. There's false prophets and deception. There's natural disasters and there's angels sent forth to gather the elect. Then he comes back at the end of the chapter, and this is what I, end of the chapter, want to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, Mike, can you read 30 through 32, the first three verses? the earth when the events that he talked about in the previous verses will see. And that generation, uh, a lot of different thoughts, who they are, will not pass away. But for the disciples, they wouldn't be alive at that time, and fellow classmates here today, we don't know if we're part of that generation. So what is given to us universally is his words do not pass away. To have something that is eternal, that is solid, that is trustworthy, it doesn't matter what you think about it, the word is the word. How many times have you said something? And you read the word and it had effect. The words do not pass away. Even if you burn all the Bibles, hopefully we've been doing a good job in Mark memorizing enough, enough verses. The word does not pass away. The second thing in this paragraph is no one knows. Only the Father knows. Even the Son doesn't know, he says here. So we don't live according to knowing when he's coming back, it's actually a relief. I don't know when he's coming back. I'm just going to stay in the word, and I'm going to keep talking to people. And if I'm fortunate and the Lord so wants it to be in my lifetime, I'll see him. 
If not, I'll see him anyway, right? One way or the other, we'll see him, right? We know this. Okay, the last paragraph. Uh, Bruce, could you read that? with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay away. Therefore, stay away. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you to sleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay away. Okay. Now, again, there are two words. The first word, be on guard, is uh, literally the word be without sleep. Okay. But yesterday, Bruce gave this, this exhortation, and my wife, sorry, dear, gave me a good example of this. If this is just a matter of intense energy and worry that I might miss something, that's very tiring. It's like... Be careful, make sure this table stays in the room. People are coming to steal. You run in every two minutes. It's just a lot of pressure. My yeah. wife one time, or a sister I know, right? My wife was driving home from Cleveland and she was tired. She was alone in the car. She wanted to stay awake. She grabbed the steering wheel tightly all the way home for three hours. Yeah, that's kind of tiring, isn't it? Yeah. So, the second half of the story is she pulled into the driveway, parked the car, fell asleep. She tells me for two hours I wasn't there. So, okay, so that's funny. And sorry, dear, I didn't know I'll pay for that. But anyway, if you think this is what be on alert is all about, you're going to have a very tiresome life. Oh, no, you might do something wrong. Okay, the other word or stay away is a word that indicates not just simple wakefulness, but it adds the idea of alertness and vigilance. Okay, now to help you understand this, I underline a phrase in 34, it's like a man going on a journey. Did somebody go to be with the Father? And the Lord Jesus went on a journey and he, when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work. What the Lord has committed to you, what the Lord has committed to me, what the Lord has committed to my family, what the Lord has committed to your family. It's hard to put on paper. But there's something within you that recognizes it and realizes it. But we don't always pay attention to it. So we are human beings, and remember the earlier section, we either get distracted or deceived. We get in fear that I'm not capable of doing what the Lord committed to me. But here he says, he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Hey, the doorkeeper, the door to what? This is going to be my personal inspiration. I don't know if you can find it in any Bible study. The spiritual connection we have to the Lord is like a doorkeeper. To keep yourself open to the Lord in your daily life will give you the ability to cultivate the sense of the Lord's presence. You'll also have the clarity what the Lord has committed to you in any situation, you'll have the strengthening how to carry it out. So he says, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. These next sections are the four wa night watches of the Roman guards. Beginning 9 p.m., midnight, 3 a.m., and 6 a.m. I don't know if you knew that. Very interesting. So in a night time, you know, when the Lord returns, it's the time of day. While he's away, we're in a time of night. I sure hope the Lord comes back in my lifetime. But the darkness around me is very clear. 
I need an attitude and a diligence and a vigilance to really seek the Lord more every day. I'm not going to be 100%. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm your classmate. And I'm doing probably just as good as you are, but we have one another. There's a kind of awakeness to the Lord speaking that he's talking about here. So this is why he emphasizes again and again and again that you have within you, the disciples will learn this, the ability to stay awake. So it's not like he's telling you to do something that you don't know. You know, if I were to say, in the last 10 minutes, would the Lord speak to you? Maybe not everyone would have something. I would say, in the last week. I think by this point in our lives, we all would have to say at least one thing very clearly. <laughs> Right? So we cultivate that sensitivity to the Lord while we're waiting for Him to return to this earth. We cultivate that sensitivity to the people around us because definitely one of our commitments is the people around us. How many of you up to in your Bible study? 52? We got to get to hymn 52 so we can sing that hymn. <laughs> the old hymnals, right? So there are people, family, friends that we have need to stay awake to their situation too. So our sensitivity to the Lord and our sensitivity to people around us is how we wait for the Lord's return. Okay, with that in view, I have a closing hymn before my conclusion. And Ted's going to give me at least a starting note. He might even play. This is the name of Jesus is our stand. Yeah, the name of Jesus is our stand. So we're going to sing just four and five because it's a good conclusion to this message. Let's read verse four. What should our posture be today in such a desperate hour? Should we our ease and pleasure seek and let the foe devour? Or with increasing conflict strong, courageous to do the door. Tis here that life or death is won. Who will God's praise secure? Okay, go ahead. and how they should live after his death and resurrection. The first two verses help them realize that uh, they should not boast in the temple. His answer to their question helped them realize that a life of temptation and suffering lay ahead of them in their appointment to preach the gospel and that they should revive. 
rely on the Spirit's name. Mm -hmm. Taking care of that person. At the end of the chapter, he exhorted them to watch and be awake in carrying out what the Master had committed to them until he returns. Yeah. An application is just a simple question. Can we learn from our classmates? Yeah. And consider how to watch and be awake in what the Lord has committed us. Yeah. No stuff that we can if we get together with our classmates. <laughs> Going to school helps. <laughs> But of the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Think he, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. We need to watch for the Lord's return and not be sleeping. Be sleeping is to be occupied with worldly things or anything that takes us from the Lord's presence. These verses keep stressing to watch, hence to pray, read the word, and fellowship. They help us to watch for our Lord's return. Related to uh, conclusions and applications, uh, finished reading another book this week by F.P. Meyer. And he was talking about the how we have our natural senses, our five senses, hearing, seeing, touch, smell, things like that. But Jeff touched on it, we have a spiritual sense as well. Our spirit has the same number of senses. So in this message, we're talking about learning to see the leading of the Spirit, to hear the speaking of the Spirit, to be able to touch the Spirit in things. Our Spirit, our regenerated Spirit, allows us to be in tune with what the Lord is doing. But if we refuse to listen, we refuse to see, we refuse to taste and see how good the Lord is in our reading and our praying and things like that, we are going to be misled. Most likely we'll fall into things. So, you know, where does the Lord, how does he answer us? He answers us in the way that is best for us to live our life daily, in the direction that he's taking us. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed a lot of things from this message. Uh, one of the first things I enjoyed was about the fig tree that uh, I never heard anyone share that before. That when the Lord, you know, spoke, when the Lord said, There's no fruit going to come from you. That actually wasn't a curse. It was, he's just saying the fact. And I like that much better because when, when I argue with Jews, they'll, they'll say, look, the Lord's unrighteous. He cursed the fig tree for no reason. And, and that he really didn't curse it. He really is just stating a fact. This is what's going to happen. Then uh, I liked also about uh, that doorkeeper. You know, what, what does it mean for the doorkeeper? Just to stay out, you know, to, to watch. Beats. That keeps the door of our heart watching for the Lord. What, what is the Lord doing? And then follow, follow the Lord. And then uh, one thing I wanted to add there was the verse that Jeff covered about many are many were going to come in my name and say, I am. 
and we'll deceive many. And that, um, I never thought about that before. I would, well, I tell you what I had thought about it before was that people are going to come saying, I'm the Messiah. Yeah. But, and, like, uh, I give you examples, like there was a lot of Jewish false messiahs that came after Christ. The, one of the most famous ones is Bar Kokhba. But Bar Kokhba and all these false messiahs, none of them came in Jesus' name. But it says, they'll come in my name, and it says, they'll say, I am, or I am he. Then there's no noun, or just, it's just, they'll say, I am, and they'll deceive many. And then in Matthew, the same verse in Matthew is just a little different, and it says, they'll, there it says, many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. But there's no one that I know of that came in the Lord's name and said, I'm the Christ. If they came in the Lord's name, they said, Jesus is the Christ, not me. But they said, oh, I'm somebody important. You need to follow me. So just, just because, so I think what it means is people will come in my name. People will come. They'll, they'll, they'll proclaim that Jesus is the Christ, but they'll come, but they'll still deceive many. Just because someone says Jesus is the Christ doesn't mean you believe, every, you believe what they say. You see, you have to be awake and, and be on guard.
Sunday is the young corporate meeting. Uh, we will be covering actually Mark chapter 14. Tuesday night prayer meeting, 7.30 to 8.30 on the Zoom. And the Wednesday night Bible study at Eric and Nancy's is still on the book of Job, 7 to 8.30. Lord, we do thank you this uh, again this morning that uh, your word is so living and operative and able to uh, teach one of us to nourish us to also um, just challenge us to look at carefully how each one of us are walking. Mm-hmm. And this week we pray, Lord, that we would seek you in all things that we do, our practical daily life, our working, our taking care of families, all those things we need to do. We would still find time to spend in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and speak the truth to us day by day. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Praise the Lord, thanks.